Welcome to New York Wine and Grape Foundation's New York State of Wine. Thank you all for taking the time out to be with us today. Diverse and bold, with a long history stretching back hundreds of years, New York is reinventing itself as an epicenter of dynamic winemaking. The state is home to the first winery in the United States, and producers are drawing on that background to produce some of the most exciting wines in the country. In this fourth episode of the series, we bring our focus to the different grape varieties planted in New York State with our host, Jamie Good. Before we get started, some housekeeping reminders for everyone. During the webinar, note that there are two communication methods available to participants, a chat section and a Q&A section. The chat section is an informal way for you to communicate with other participants. Uh, just be sure to select all panelists and attendees uh, in the two field, as it can default to panelists only. The Q&A section is where we'd like you to submit your questions to be answered during the webinar by the panel. Now to introduce our speakers, as I mentioned, moderating today's panel is Jamie Good. Jamie is a London-based wine writer, lecturer, and judge. He is currently wine columnist with UK national newspaper, The Sunday Express, in addition to contributing regularly to a range of publications, including The World of Fine Wine, Noble Rot, Wine and Spirits in the USA, Wine Business International, Drinks International, Wines and Vines, and Vine Pair. He is also author of the book, Wine Science, which won the Glenn Fittich Award for Drinks book in 2006. Jamie has a PhD in plant biology and worked as a book editor before joining the world of wine with his site, wineanorak.com, now one of the leading wine websites. He won the 2007 Glenn Fittich Wine Writer of the Year Award. Joining Jamie are Nova Katamachri, NW, in addition to her role as owner and winemaker at Trestle 31, Nova is a writer and blogger. As one of the first graduates of Cornell's Viticulture and Enology program in 2006, Nova relocated to California to assume a number of winemaking roles. She has worked for numerous iconic wineries in California, including Robert Mondavi Winery, Souverain, Beringer, and Chateau St. Jean. In 2017, she became the first female winemaker to become an MW in the U.S., and in 2014, Katamatri, what, Katamatri was named in Wine Enthusiast Top 40 Under 40 list. Originally from South Carolina, Katamatri began her career in wine after moving to New York to pursue horticulture. She splits her time between the Finger Lakes, where she and her family have Trestle 31, and Napa, California, where she is Director of Winemaking for Robert Mondavi Winery. Nathan Kendall, Finger Lakes native and founder winemaker of Nathan Kendall Wines. Nathan is internationally trained with experience in wine regions, including Sonoma, Willamette Valley, Waipara, Adelaide Hills, and Mosul. The plan was always to return to the shores of Seneca Lake, where he established Nathan Kendall Wines in 2011. His passion is to create wines in an old world style using quality grapes and minimal intervention with focus on Riesling, Pinot Noir, Chardonnay, and sparkling wine. Ben Riccardi, founding owner and winemaker of Osmote Winery in the Finger Lakes. Ben worked around the globe in France, Australia, New Zealand, Chile, and California, including William Selliam in California, Craggy Range in New Zealand, and City Winery, New York in Manhattan. He has a technical winemaking degree from Cornell University but seeks a gentler touch with the raw material of this region in order to develop texture alongside the bright acids of these light ethereal wines. Ben was born in the Finger Lakes and lives with his family at the southern end of Seneca Lake on a shared 31 acre farm. All right, so let's get started. Over to you, Jamie. Hey, um, could we have the map, um, Katie, the map of the um, New York State? Because I think it would be good just to start with a quick um, look at the, um, the regions we're gonna be looking at. Well, we're specifically focusing on the largest region in New York State today, which is the Finger Lakes. Um, but you'll see there that there's quite a few wine regions um, in um, New York State. And the common feature uh, of all of them is the presence of water, either in the form of lakes, and um, obviously in the Finger Lakes, um, there's a few of them, um, Long Island, the second um, most significant region um, there is, is sticking out into 
water as well and surrounded by water moderates the the um the the temperatures um by keeping it from getting too hot in the summer and also in the winter just getting those those low temperatures making sure they don't drop too low um, because if they drop too low um, it can kill vines um, and then there's the hudson river region it looks like a huge region but there's actually not a lot of vineyards there there are some there's some interesting things happening there um, and then if you look over to the um the east no the west which is to the left um you'll see that at the top there niagara escarpment um, there's a very significant wine region just over the border there in Canada, the Niagara region. Um, so this is a, a kind of an area where I guess we could say it's the lakes. Uh, the lakes have, have made viticulture possible here. And um, the climate and the soils are really interesting and resulting in some really interesting wines. So let's move on. Um, I'd just like to ask um, um, Ben, Nathan and Nova, just one by one, just could you Give us a quick introduction to your winemaking projects um, in in New York State, and I'll begin with Ben. Um, tell us about Osmote. Great, yeah. Osmote is what I have started since uh, 2014. Um, I was still um, a production winemaker in Manhattan with City Winery. And I was in Manhattan because um, I had kind of settled in California, but felt rather homesick. And after I moved uh, that much closer to, to Manhattan, I realized, I, you know, I still didn't have that connection enough to, to home. Um, so I, I had to do something. And I, and I felt like there was a lot of room um, within the Finger Lakes uh, winemaking community to have a project that was a little bit more uh, texturally focused and um, put an emphasis on Chardonnay, which was kind of a uh, uh, under the radar grape, maybe while, while we're so wholly focused on uh, Riesling. Um, so yeah, since 2014, it's been going really well. I moved uh, up here with my uh, fiance at the time in 17, and we've seen some pretty good growth um, and have expanded into some very exciting markets. We're in the UK now with uh, Wood Winters. Great, super. Um, so um, Nathan, you've got fingers in a few pies, I gather. Could you just um, tell us about what you're up to? Uh, yes, yeah. so um, I started my original little project in 2011 with a focus on um, Riesling uh, and Pinot Noir and kind of doing something similar to Ben and, and chasing texture. Um, so the Rieslings, you know, a lot of barrel fermentation, a lot of lees aging, the, the red wine, the Pinot Noir is, um, fresher style, more whole cluster, you know, um, and then I sort of branched out in 2015 and 16 and took on a couple other projects. Uh, one being Hickory Hollow, which is, um, a focus on different varieties and more of a polished style of winemaking and more red wine, uh, and Cab Franc focused. And then the same, or the following year, I started a project, um, Shapika, where the focus is on sparkling wines um, from very, very old 200 year old hybrids that the region was kind of built upon. Fantastic, yeah. Um, and Nova, um, Trestle 31. Yes, so, um, so Trestle 31 is kind of the culmination of the dream that got both my husband and I into the wine industry. So back in 2002, we had started dating and he's kind of one of those people that always comes up with business ideas. And so he, um, on one of our dates says, oh, we should start a vineyard. My family in Italy did it. It can't be that hard. And so that like, that kind of drove that one phrase, that one concept kind of drove the next 20 years of work. And um, we didn't come from the wine industry. We didn't come from wine backgrounds. Um, so that's what led me to get a wine or uh, viticulture degree at Cornell. Um, then we moved out to California and learned as much as we could about the industry. And then in 2015, we got the opportunity to move back to the Finger Lakes. And uh, when we moved back, we started Trestle 31. So we bought 12 acres of land on Seneca Lake that's just south of Geneva on the Northeast side. 
And the goal there is eventually to have our own property and our own vines and everything. But right now we're purchasing fruit from the neighboring vineyard, which is Zagabee Vineyard. So that's where our Riesling comes from. And we also introduced a Chardonnay in 2017, um, which I totally agree with Ben. I feel like it's a little unsung hero of the Finger Lakes. And I think we can definitely rival what's being done in Chablis because we've got that fresh acid and it's so beautiful and minerally. And um, so th that's kind of my focus there. So I look at making wines that sit in the span of the global wines of the great styles of those varieties. And so my real inspiration, you know, comes from Austria and Germany and Alsace for Riesling and then um, for, um, for Chardonnay, definitely from Burgundy. So that, that's kind of how we, we function as our own winery. Fantastic. So yeah, we, we've got a, um, so our focus with today's session is on, um, is on grape varieties because New York State has got an interesting mix of grape varieties. Um, in part, this is a climatic um, thing. Um, the kind of the Eastern United States has got a long history of growing wine grapes, but most of that history has been growing um, native or hybrid grape varieties, which have a degree of resistance to, first of all, they have cold hardiness because in the winters, the temperatures can dip pretty low. Um, we're looking at, you know, vines start to get damaged. I mean, it depends on, you know, a, a lot of factors, but the rule of thumb is once you get below minus 20, um, vines suffer quite a lot. Vit Vitis vinifera grape vines, that is, you know, the varieties that we know and love like Chardonnay, Riesling, um, Syrah, Pinot Noir, all these varieties that we're familiar with. The majority, I guess, of the, the wines that we drink today come from Vitis vinifera and it's sensitive to, um, to um, the cold. And so that's one of the reasons that hybrids have been um, so dominant in the history of New York State. And the other factor is the disease pressure um, can be really high here. In the summer, it can get pretty humid, gets warm and humid, and um, vinifera um, suffers a great deal in these conditions, um, unless it's managed really carefully. Um, but since the 1950s, um, um, a lot of um, a lot of vinifera has gone in, and the sites where the, that are a bit more protected, that are a bit more near the lakes, um, and so we've got this really interesting mix of grape varieties, but I think it can be a little bit confusing to the outsider. So really I'd like to target this question to you, Nova. Um, could you just explain the difference between the, the different groups of vines grown here? So what's the native or the brusca, French American hybrids, modern hybrids, Vitis vinifera, what, what are the differences? Sure, so you know, native grapes are the grapes that are just found naturally growing in North America. So the ones that you typically find growing in New York for um, production of any sort, not just wine, but also juice and things like that. But Concord is by far probably the largest planet. You also have Niagara and Delaware, you know, so those are, are really, um, you know, pure native Vitus Labrusca um, wines or varieties. So when you're looking at the difference between French American hybrids and modern hybrids, like conceptually, there's really not a whole lot of difference there. They're hybrids between native varieties found here in the US. It doesn't have to be Labrusca, it could be Riparia, things like that, but also Vitus vinifera, so the European grapevine. Um, and so crosses of that are what makes hybrids. Now, what kind of constitutes the difference between French American hybrids and more modern hybrids is most, uh, if not all of the older versions of French American hybrids were developed in the mid 1800s as a solution for phylloxera. And they weren't really developed at the time for high quality wine production. It was really more a focus of, is it resistant to phylloxera? Is it resistant to some of these other diseases like powdery mildew? Um, and so what you see is kind of a mix of things, whereas the more modern hybrids, particularly the ones coming out of the University of Minnesota and also Cornell University, you see a lot more focus put on not only the resistance and the cold tolerance, but also the wine quality coming out of them. So some of the really exciting wines that are, have come out, um, Cube is a little bit of an older modern hybrid, but I would still consider it a modern hybrid, really nice white wine. Um, Tremonet is another really exciting modern hybrid. Um, Marquette, I think, is, has a lot of potential as a red wine grape. But like you mentioned, Jamie, that, that the marketability can be a little bit dicey. So I think from, uh, from a marketing standpoint, there's a lot of opportunity with things like red blends and white blends, um, where you don't necessarily have to call out the variety on the label as driving more of a stylistic 
discussion. And I think that's really where some of these hybrids are going to shine in, in the future. And of course, vitamins are different. Your, you know, your common European grapevine. So there's a number of different cultivars grown for that. So that's really that's really cool. Thank you. That's a really good explanation because I think it can be a little confusing to the outsiders. People hear the term hybrid. They hear the term native. And, and you know, I've, when I've looked into this, it's this history of some of these grape varieties is really fascinating, you know, because um, some there just aren't records of how, you know, people would have just taken grapes from the woods mm -hmm. and um, planted them at some stage. And then, you know, um, it's, it's a really interesting um, to see this. And it's part of, the, I guess it's part of the, the heritage of the Eastern United States. And there's not many places where there's so many of these different sorts of varieties to play with. But um, Nathan, um, You've worked with native varieties. You mentioned the Chepica, and you've made and those wines have been really successful. Um, and I think they're fantastic. Um, so, you know, why do you think think people are so down on the hybrids? Do you think they're just not very good quality, or do you think that um, you know that it's just that people haven't tried hard enough with them? Uh I don't think people have tried hard enough with them. It's um, a lot of people dumped a lot of money into planting these vinifera vineyards that um, they're concerned with um, hybrids taking too much of the market share or, or these Nebraska varieties. But I would dispute that because as we've touched on earlier that these, these um, uh, particular kinds of wines, they can be grown in um, colder sites, you know, where, where the land's cheaper. You can't get away with vinifera unless you're working with geotextiles, but nobody here has even dabbled with in that. Um, so I think that's part of the problem. And I do think quality wine can be made with them because the market that we're selling to today, it, it isn't the old market. They don't want the, the buttery Chardonnays and the 15% alcohol bombs that their parents were drinking. They want something fresh. They want something tasty. And I don't think they necessarily care what it's made of as long as it delivers and we can grow them sustainably. I think it's a big issue as well. It's a bit, I think that taps into the desire. I think a lot of people are, are, are a little bit anxious about some of the inputs that a viticulture has at the moment. Um, and really to, to farm sustainably, truly sustainably is, is I guess a lot easier um, with these varieties. Um, and I guess that reduces the farming costs as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you had mentioned um, uh, spray applications and whatnot, and these um, grapes being better suited to the uh, disease pressure. You might spray your vinifera grapes 10 to 12 times a year, but with these uh, hybrids and natives, you're going through five to six times a year. So far less inputs on that end. Yeah. And with that, I guess less soil compaction, um, it's there's there's lots of wins there someone's asked in the q a um are these native varieties grafted or not no no they're not they don't, they so don't they're ungrafted be because they're naturally resistant to phylloxera and, and and most nematodes actually as well so that i mean those are the real key reasons to be grafting vines um, so, so that's not an issue usually i mean you can graft them but there really is no reason to. So are the modern hybrids, are they grafted or are they ungrafted? They're ungrafted typically. Uh, right. when, you, when you speak of like a, a Marquette um, from Minnesota, that, that's ungrafted. And um, yeah, it, you know, that unfortunately, like I'm not seeing that capacity in um, the, the peewee varieties, which may be a little bit more marketable and, and exciting. Yeah, can I just, just for the audience, so, so peewee varieties Ben's referring to, they're the modern resistant varieties that have got some, um, so basically in Europe now there's a big um, residue and the peewee movement uh, as people breeding basically um, um, hybrids effectively, but they don't like to call them hybrids, that they, they, get, they want to get the genes for resistance to powdery and downy mildew into these vines because that's what causes the main input. And so they're breeding and they check whether the, the vines are resistant and then they breed them back. They, they back breed them with more vinifera varieties, trying to get out some of the characters and get, um, that some people don't like in, in hybrid vines. And they're trying to get closer to the taste of some of the famous vinifera varieties. So I guess, yeah, you're right that, that they would probably have lost their resistance to phylloxera through this process. 
the, I mean, those varieties to me are super, super exciting. Um, and I saw a question, you know, talking about the, the grafting, that, that's a real key player in our environment because we are such a cold, cold climate. And as such, um, the, probably the most uh, cold susceptible part of the vine would be that callus of the graft union. Mm -hmm. um, so, so here to prep for the winter, we're hilling vines up, putting earth over that tender uh, graft union. And if, you know, if we were to move into hybrid varieties that didn't need to be grafted, that, that's a um, really significant, you know, I mean, it's like a, it's like a tillage step, you know, that we could eliminate and, um, you know, we can plant on steeper slopes in good conscience and survive winters with a lot less input and a lot less um, soil damage. So, so, you know, hybrids will be exciting for our region. And are there any hybrid varieties that excite you particularly? <laughs> um, TBD. You know, okay. <laughs> it, it, it's, it's not something that I have um, investigated ne with uh, ne nearly thorough enough, but um, I can tell you in, um, you know, kind of moving in parallel with, with Nathan and looking backwards at old varieties, I'm really excited with the vine stock that's already here. But, yeah. So, um, Let's move on um, to Vitis vinifera and the, the one variety that the Finger Lakes has become truly famous for, um, it's Star Turn, um, is Riesling. And we have a Riesling to taste and it's from Trestle 31. So Nova, um, I'm gonna pour myself a glass of this Riesling. Could, could you tell us about Riesling in, and, and your Riesling in particular? Sure, um, so when I think of Riesling, I think, um, to me, Riesling has, it's an amazing potential. It's just got a marketing issue, you know? And I, I really truly believe we're still kind of fighting that misconception that was put out in the, you know, 70s and 80s with the Lee Fromage and the, you know, the, the pretty standard uh, basic wines that were put out during that time on the market. And we're still fighting that perception today. So I wanted to do something with my wine um, to make it stand alone as a great white wine, not just a great Riesling, but a great white wine on its own. So that's why I didn't put it in a Hawk bottle. I put it in a Burgundy bottle because I want people, even as they approach the wine, to not have any preconceived notions of what it's gonna taste like. Um, and so for me, really working with uh, Riesling, I wanna focus on the texture on the palate and have building that fruit weight without adding too much sugar in it. Um, so up until the 2018, all of our wines were bone dry. Now in 2018, what happened, it was a very wet year. We had a lot of um, disease pressure that year and it was a very cool year. But what happened in our vineyard is we had a really amazing botrytis influence. So about 30% noble rot. And so once we got the fruit into the press and pressed it out, the bricks was like 24, five, which is so much higher than we typically see. Um, I realized that I wasn't gonna be able to make the same style of wine in 2018 that I had the previous four, uh, three years. And so I immediately looked to Austria Smarags and what they do in Alsace with the Grand Cru Rieslings and looked to see what those styles do and how they do it really well. And that was really my inspiration for 2018. So it's this really weighty, rich wine um, and it's it's got such great body and nose and texture to it, um, but it still finishes dry, which is what the point of the wines are. It's like, I really want it to feel dry. And so having that balance between um, the, the sugar and the, the body and the acid is really critical. And the vineyard we get it from, Zugaby, is a much lower acid vineyard than what you see on the southern parts of the lakes. And so I'm able to do a really beautiful dry style without having really screaming acid from that spot. So I really like it for that reason. I think it's lovely. It's got a beautiful, um, there's a picture of the label here. Um, really impressive wine. Um, it's, got, it's got weight, it's good, but it's also got this beautiful precision, this tapering finish with this sort of fine spices. And as you say, it's 
13 and a half grams of sugar a litre is swallowed up by this wine. And it's like, it just doesn't, because that would have added almost a whole alcohol percentage to it, right. wouldn't it? And you'd have yeah. been pushing 15, which would have been bonkers. It would have been crazy, yeah. exactly. And so that was one um, of the reasons. I had to change the yeast I used this year. I changed the, the style of the wine. I mean, my goal is to make the best wine possible by what nature gives me. And I don't ever want to be hung up on, oh, well, we only do this style. You know, so my, my goal is to, to flex with the vintage and whatever it gives me, I'm going to make the best wine from that. And usually that's a dry wine, but in 2018, uh, this is what we ended up with. That's a really intelligent approach to winemaking, I think, especially in a region where you're going to get some level of vintage variation. Mm -hmm. It's almost like just just keeping a track of how things are going and then thinking about, well, what is the most sensible interpretation of the grapes that are coming in? You know, yeah. and so, I think... Yeah, sorry, for each of our vintages, they all show the vintage very clearly. You know, they're, none of them are exactly the same style. None of them are exactly the same personality. So my, my goal is to translate the vintage and have people really see those vintage to vintage variations in a really clear way. And that's interesting because I, and we're so often, we, we dominate, well, our discussions about fine wine are dominated by, um, you know, showing the sight in the wine, you know, the terroir. Mm -hmm. But shouldn't we be true to vintage as well? I think that's a really interesting question. And it's like um, allowing you, it's almost like the, the vintage speaks. And if you listen, then you can capture that um, message of the vintage, which is part of the richness of wine, I think. Um, and, and I think this is a, this is a, a really impressive wine. I love the, the mouthfeel, the texture, and it's not heavy. It's 14% alcohol, but it doesn't taste heavy at all. It tastes, it still tastes, has some precision, but then there's generosity as well. And, um, and it's a very interesting, 30% botrytis is a lot, yes. but um, I wouldn't be able to tell that from the wine. Maybe it's this little bit of spicy, mm -hmm. exotic apricot character there. Um, but it's it's really a thought thought provoking wine. Thank you so much. Yeah, that was that was the whole goal. So, um, Nathan, what's what's your view on Riesling? Why is Riesling in the Finger Lakes so successful? What is it that's put Riesling in pole position? Um, for me, uh, one of my personal beliefs is Riesling really needs a long season, cool season, for the flavors to develop. Um, that's why I think the style that we're doing here is more elegant than what you would see, um, coming out of regions like California or Oregon. Um, so I think that's one reason, um, you know, also the, the soil that we have here. So not just the climate, the long season, um, the Riesling thrives, you know, mm -hmm. I mean, typically, uh, you know, our, our soil is almost too rich. So part of the problem we're up against is battling vigor. Um, what else? Yeah, I mean, there's, there's a lot of variables. Yeah. Yeah, Ben, what do you think of Riesling and why is it so popular? Um, cold hardiness. Right. <laughs> it, it, uh, it has worked really well through our winters and come through into the next vintage time and time again with a quality yield. And, um, you know, I mean, it, it, so, so there's the um, repeatability, the, the, you know, the way you can bank on it. Um, and, and we've kind of built up around that. And in terms of winemaking in the region for Riesling, um, has that, is it all very similar or has there been quite a bit of experimentation? Um, are we seeing sort of more alternative I, I think, approaches to winemaking? If, if I may, I think, I think we're starting to see a more varied uh, touch, but um, I mean, years ago, I think there was a lot of uh, homogeneity to, to the winemaking. Now we're um, seeing people with more indigenous ferments, um, people like Nova clearly embracing hi higher and higher levels of uh, botrytis and, and you know richness that wasn't there before. There's a little bit more risk taking. And um, so I, I don't think there's a, a general speak, uh, mm -hmm. but for, for what is reasoning why I'm making it's, it, we're, we're really experimenting widely now. That's great. So, um, 
I've got a question for you, which kind of follows on, moving on from reasoning. Um, you know, which are the varieties that you've had the most success with and which varieties impress you most um, in, the, in the Finger Lakes? Chardonnay. I, I love um, Chardonnay. Uh, I would say similarly, there is the cold hardiness, maybe not quite as uh, stout as, as Riesling. And um, you had alluded earlier to the humidity of our climate. So uh, downy mildew is definitely a bigger problem within Chardonnay. Um, but as we get more and more sophisticated as vine growers and, um, and then there's, there's like a, a Chardonnay was kind of like when people were still throwing darts at the wall, trying to figure out what stuck. I, I think there was, there was a lot of Chardonnay being planted in, in the field and, and then people, um, Kind of pivoted more towards Riesling. Um, it was so unique and a, kind of a special marketing opportunity and, and Chardonnay got um, for, forgotten, I felt. Um, so when I started in 2014, kind of as an outsider still based in Manhattan and everything, um, I knew that if I focused on um, Chardonnay, rather than Riesling, I would get access um, to some real vine age that I probably wouldn't see if I was working in, in Riesling. So, um, you know, we have, we have history. We do have a, a climate where, where Chardonnay can excel. Chardonnay comes off the vine much, much earlier than Riesling um, avoids, uh, the, you know, the occasional year where like the tail end of a hurricane may bring in a lot of moisture into our region. We can get Chardonnay off well before that and still have uh, richness and, and you know, all the building blocks for beautifully textured and, and light wine. So what style of Chardonnay do you think um, the region is, is, has got talent for? Um, is there a particular style that it, that it, that it does best? Uh, I would like to think that maybe I'm um, pursuing a more uh, flinty and uh, reductive sort of mineral style. Um, you know, so maybe that's like an inspiration from someone like a, like a Kumia River, like a Shaw Smith, Sean Smith type, type feel. Um, you know, I worked at Craggy Range and I was really taken aback with, uh, I don't know if they make it anymore, but back then they had the Kidnappers Cliff Cuvee. Yeah, fantastic was, one. Um, yeah, really good. Yeah. Yeah. I much think they more, might have broke that much vineyard because it's far as, yeah. Pardon me? Um, it's in Teowanga, isn't it? It's in the coastal area. It's the more exposed. Yeah, area. rather than the gravels. And yeah, yeah. Um, so much more uh of a cooler uh climactic influence on that and then they were raising it in um very very large um oak barrels and um you know and then i tra traveled down and i had um te coco and, and section 94 and I, and i got really inspired by these um you know heavy solid um wild you know, oak ferments. And um, I feel like making the wine in that style um, delivers the texture and helps uh, amplify that, that mineral essence. Um, yeah. So I've been trying to apply that in, in my own winemaking here, which I, cool. I think honestly is kind of a break from, you know, the, 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 the Chardonnay of old here was either like super buttery or we made something super buttery and then we mixed it half with a totally tart green apple stainless steel thing. And this is our now lightly oak Chardonnay style. And, and I'm moving in a different direction. It's like, well, let's just make the oak bigger and have a longer, slower natural ferment that, you know, incorporates the oak into the body of the wine a lot better. And, you know, I'm actually a hundred percent in an oak 
uh, fermentation and using a lot of new barrels, but I'm getting that lighter oak imprint. Yeah, very cool. Thank you. Well, talking of Chardonnay, um, Nathan, we have your wine here. This is the 2019 Finger Lake Chardonnay. Um, can we talk about this? I don't know if there's much to say. Ben uh, did a great job selling Chardonnay. Um, <laughs> so there's a lot of points that he hit on that um, I would totally agree with. I mean, vine age. Um, I started a Chardonnay, the program in 2015, so a year after Ben. And uh, with that, um, the two sites I work with are between 45 and 50 years old, um, which if I were to start looking for Chardonnay now, I wouldn't have access to vineyards like that. Um, and also, as I'll second the, the thing that it, we're pulling them early. We're picking them early, ripe every single year, um, which some years you're kind of hanging on, you know, crossing your fingers that... Uh, the Riesling flavors are going to get where you want them to be and the acid's going to drop and you're not going to get hit with bad weather. Um, and then again, uh, another point we've all touched on is the acidity that we have in this region um, and the moderate alcohol levels. I mean, what we, what we get with Chardonnay, uh, I think is a really special thing. And with that said, you know, my approach to the winemaking is similar and slightly different than Ben's approach. Um, so here we're hand picking everything, foot stomp and then press it, settle it for 24 hours, put the juice down into neutral barrels. So Ben was talking about larger, newer barrels. I'm working with a 228 liter barriques um, that range in age from five to eight years old. So if there's any bit of oak flavor in the wine, it's from those little neutral barrels. And I try to pull that out because once the barrels are completely neutral, they go to the Riesling program. Um, and also another thing I like about Chardonnay is the diversity of styles. I mean, um, if somebody likes that tart green apple uh, stainless ferment, we have that and we can do it well. Um, if you want the richer style done in barrels, kiss, kiss with some new oak, we do that well. And most importantly, um, I honestly think the best expression of Chardonnay in the Finger Lakes is sparkling, you know, because you're really doubling down. And guess what? You can pick underripe grapes with acid every single year consistently. Um, it's a beautiful wine. Um, this is 12% alcohol, but it's full of flavor, but it's light and delicate. It's a paradox of a wine. It's light and delicate, but there's there's just something there. It's not just ephemeral. There's there's a real intensity here. Um, it's fully ripe, but it's got keen acidity. Um, I think it's, it's really delicate. I mean, it's uh, this must be one of your best, I reckon. The nineteen, do you think? It's, yeah, uh, that's that's my favorite one. I really like that vintage because um, it was kind of the polar opposite of you know we uh, Nova talked about twenty eighteen. Um, where it was hot and wet in uh, August in 2019. August, it's like a switch was flipped and we had cool days and cold nights, which allowed a really long time to hang on the vine. Um, and also when I started doing Chardonnay, I was very dogmatic about it has to be unfiltered. It has to be unfiltered. Well, then 2016 happened, which was a warm, ripe year. And God, the wine was so flabby. People you know, general consumers loved it, but for me, it was lacking that, that fresh quality that we provide in the Finger Lakes. So starting in 17, I'm only working with partial malolactic fermentation and I am filtering now and just kind of tasting the barrels as they go along. And when I feel they have that, you know, textural richness, but still that bright acidic backbone, um, that's when I tend to pump the brakes on them. And then they age on the gross leaves for just under a year um, and during Elevage, they tend to pick up that uh, slightly smoky reductive note, yeah. um, but I'm not doing anything to treat reduction, you know, if it's good. Because it's a big, the, the, the toying with reduction has become a, a very common element of um, Chardonnay production. Ambitious producers are lo looking to get this little matchstick character, um, but it's a perilous activity I think it can it can be an artifact if it's not done if there's too much of it and I think this is this is in a beautiful place this one I'm really really impressed with this 
Thank it's you. A, just a precision again, and, and, and um, no, it's, it's really um. Just a, it's it's kind of rare to find places that can make Chardonnay with this sort of tension and precision, and I think that's really exciting. So this is so presumably you think there's a bright future for Chardonnay as well in the region. Yeah, and I mean we've we're all in agreement on that. The three winemakers on the panel we clearly have a passion for Chardonnay and see some great potential for it here. Mm, great, super. Um, so. Um, I mean, is Chardonnay grown much elsewhere outside the Finger Lakes? And Long Island has, has some and Hudson has some. And occasionally yeah. you see it out on the west in the Erie Belt or the Niagara Escarpment. Um, so I think it has more of a presence than people think because everybody kind of thinks Friesling when they think New York State. But I think, again, you know, I think Ben said made the best point is saying it's kind of flown under the radar for a long time. And even though it's, it's really reliable in the area, um, my husband is like, as soon as we did our 2017 Chardonnay, he was like, we need to make more of this. This is, this is amazing stuff. And, you know, for me, it's, it's like focusing on that kind of Grand Cru Chablis style where you've got that really tensiony acid, but then you've got that little piece of oak and, and all that lees work. And, and I think our region just highlights that and can really stand up there. So, um, you know, it's, it's just a great variety for the area. So in terms of whites for, New York State generally, Riesling, Chardonnay, the two main players. Is that right? Yeah, I, I think you can make an argument for Pinot Gris, Gewurz. Um, I mean, we are, we talked about the hybrids already. You know, there's a, yeah. a number of hybrids that could work. But um, but yeah, I think of Vinifera, definitely the two top standouts are, are Riesling and Chardonnay at this point. Do you think there's much of a future for blends? Because obviously we talked about these, some of the more unusual hybrid varieties. If you stick the name of those on the label, um, it can make it kind of difficult to sell. Um, but if, you know, could there be a role for all these different varieties in terms of creating white blends? Um, I would say yes. Uh, I did some trialing with uh, Riesling and Cayuga blends for sparkling wine. And um, I, abs I think the results turned out really well. And by incorporating um, Cayuga into the fold, you're, you can bring down your cost greatly because you know hybrid varieties are significantly cheaper. All right, so it's, is, is it cheaper to buy a ton of hybrids than a ton of vinifera then, significantly? Oh, yeah. Significantly. Yeah. So well, there's a kind of an opportunity, if, if you can sell it, if you can make a really interesting wine, maybe you can make it naturally or just do, do something different with it. Um, out of the um, the hybrids and the natives, if they're so much cheaper to buy, then that creates a sort of a, a market opportunity, I guess, for, for for young winemakers who've got ambition but haven't got an awful lot of capital. And if they can make compelling wines, then it, that could work in the marketplace, presumably. Sounds like a nice segue. Yeah. <laughs> so the segue. Yes, we have. Um, so, Ben, you've you've. Um, this is your wine. This is a, this is a beautiful label. Did one of your ch children draw it? And <laughs> that was a joke, by the way. <laughs> no, um, that's classic um, natural winemaker. Yeah. yeah, it is. It's really cool. It's very cool. It's um. um so tell us about this wine because it's made from a, a variety called Dachonac. Um, yeah, this is one of those old school hybrids. Um, a grower with whom I've been working, he um started in the 70s and was selling you know fresh fruit juice to the big sort of uh wine cooperative that we had here and then shortly after he planted this stuff they dropped their contracts with everyone to take um like wine from chile and california instead and um, that was a real gut punch to the entire industry, um, which Blessing in Disguise kind of launched our modern era of, um, you know, farm wineries. But, um, you know, while so many other people just moved on and knocked these vines out, this guy kept with it. And here we are with, you know, pr pretty well forgotten red hybrid like old hybrid variety that really came from France where so many of the new hybrids 
are hybridized here by like Cornell and other universities. Um, this is an old hybrid with, you know, some, some vines may be 50 years of vine age. Um, although, you know, he's been replanting for some winter kill and, and such. Um, but, you know, it's just a really neat, um, almost, it's, it's not a, it's not a Tenturier variety, but it's a very, very um, high anthocyanin, and very, very dark um, variety. Uh, I pick it even earlier than, than Chardonnay. And, um, and then I, I, I do a pretty, you know, kind of natural winemaking protocol with this. So I cold soak these Deshaunac grapes for a, a while, press it into a dark red juice, and then ferment it on the whole cluster already pressed out skins from my Chardonnay program. So it's, is it Piquet? Oh, that's cool. Is it an orange wine? Is it yeah. a hybrid? Like who knows, but it's, it's just this unique fun thing that I'm doing and playing around with. That's really interesting. It's, um, look, it's, uh, you know, the Chonac is an interesting variety. I, I, was, I remember reading about it because it was, um, it's one of the Siebel crosses. So there's this guy called Albert, I think it's Albert Siebel, who made some crosses in the 1860s and named a whole load of hybrid varieties after him. So Siebel with a number after it. And then there was a guy called Adamar de Chonac, who was a very important figure, actually in the Niagara region in Canada. He was like one of the people who would really changed the varietal mix up in Canada because he spent a lot of time in New York state in the, I think it was the forties or the fifties. And then he went to Niagara and, and so this variety was named after him. And um, it's really interesting. This is, a, I think this is a beautiful wine. It's, as you say, it's, it's, I love this creative way you've made it, you know, like um, fermentation on the Chardonnay skins. It's such a cool idea. And um, because the result is like nine and a half, um, percent, well, 10 and a half percent alcohol and, and um, and yet it's got this delicacy to it. It's got finesse. It's lighter colored red, and it's eighteen bucks. So it's like you know, by New York State standards, this is an affordable wine, but it's really compelling. Excellent. Thank you so much. I'm I'm really pleased that you like it. You know, it was, and there was some good research coming out from Cornell, um, kind of saying that. Um, the, the tannins and, and hybrids, it's, it's there, there, you know, but a uh, big part of the problem is there's so much protein in hybrid varieties and the combination of the two, ultimately the wine that you make so often just lacks anything for a Yes, textural. because tannins, what tannins do, tannins, their job is to bind up proteins. You know, they, they stick to proteins. It's like um, the reason we taste um, tannic wine is astringent is because the tannins are binding up with all the proteins in our mouth and delubricating the mouth so it tastes astringent and so what's interesting is that so if you if you've got a lot of proteins as you say in in the must when you've pressed then you're going to lose a lot of your tannins because they'll just bind to the proteins precipitate out but i guess the clever thing is is then to use the chardonnay um, skins because you're kind of bypassing that problem a little bit. I don't, don't wouldn't can't imagine the exact interactions, but it's a it's a really thoughtful way of doing it. But also in terms of flavors, this is there's nothing deviant or foxy or weird about the flavors of this 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 wine. It's very pure. It's very precise. I think that's this prejudice a, that's a misnomer. Is, huh? That's a misnomer about hybrids. I think yeah, is that totally, they are yeah. foxy. They get foxy. Yeah. Can you pick them early enough that they're still within their own sort of fruit expression? And then if you have any concern about ripeness or richer tannins, it's there in Chardonnay. Yeah. My, um, my impression has been that a lot of the prejudice against hybrids is because initially when, you know, you had the, the phylloxera crisis, um, people were panicking and they wanted to, to create these hybrids that were phylloxera resistant, but then their winemaking was not sensitive or intelligent, or then it was a formulaic winemaking and the re wines resulting might've been terrible then. But, you know, I think it, it's left a legacy where people have got this prejudice. They look at 
um, hybrids through this prejudicial window of past failures. Um, and it only takes a few successes to show that it's possible to make really compelling wines from these varieties. And I think this is, this is lovely, this is cracking. Um, and also it fits with the modern taste. You know, when there's a real market now for lighter style red wines with precision, you know, the, the, and I think this is just that. There's some questions coming through. Um, one is how resi resistant is a variety, is a hybrid like Dishonac and how often do you have to spray it? So D Dishonac is really quite resistant. It's, um, it's an own rooted variety here and we have um, it's kind of clay, more so loamy soils. So phylloxera would very much be a problem here and still, it, but yet it thrives. Um, it cannot take uh, a sulfur spray that would burn the leaves. Um, so I think that tells you how much natural resistance this, this vine has that, it, I mean, it doesn't get the, the, even the most like standard spray. Um, as Nathan alluded earlier, maybe five sprays in our climate, which is um, certainly one half of what we normally get. Tons of anthocyanins, um, probably, you know, things to probably to protect its, itself um, from a lot of the, the fungal diseases. And it's a pretty um, loose cluster. It's got a good thickness to the, to the skin. So, you know, I've not experienced uh, botrytis or, or things like this. And, and then I, I get it off really early. Uh, you know, if um, we're, we're speaking like the very beginning of October. Yeah. So um, another question that came through, I'll just field this to Nathan. Is cost the only factor um, Oh, so is cost the biggest deterrent for New York producers avoiding geotextiles thus far, or are there, are there other factors to hilling up? That was the question. Um, cost, they're extremely labor intensive. And um, I don't think, you know, we're paying and our, our farmers not to knock any of them, but maybe they're not paying enough attention to what's going on in other countries. Um, because for me, it was something that I didn't really know existed until I went up to uh, Quebec a couple of years ago and saw the success that they were having. But also at the same time, it's, it's the labor and the cost is wild. I mean, my buddy up there who's had good luck with it, you know, in the Finger Lakes, when we're done picking our grapes, we crack open some beers and party and celebrate because we're done. But working in that system, as soon as you pick your grapes, the next thing you're doing is pruning and laying down all the vines and getting them covered. So it's just a lot of time, a lot of effort, and a lot of money. Yeah, I, I came across them in Quebec as well, and where the, I think Quebec is leading the world with geotextiles. It's been a game changer for them because they, they have an even colder climate and the winters yeah. there are pretty brutal. And the, um, it's meant that they've had primary bud survival, uh, whereas in the past they were kind of like losing a lot of primary buds and they were growing from secondary buds. And it's changed the, um, what they can do completely. And I know in Canada and Prince Edward County, they're still healing up by and large, but a few people have experimenting with geotextiles. And so just for the, for the for listeners or viewers who are not familiar with this, so the idea is that in very, very cold climates, um, if you're growing vinifera, you have to cover it over um, with soil in the winter, or the new solution is to use this kind of felt-like material called geotextiles. So you kind of, you kind of lay the, the vines down, and then you um, then you then you have to cover it with this this felt like material, which is very low intensive. It's quite expensive as well, and and that's the one of the ways of dealing with the winter cold. Um, and if you use geote geotextiles in, um, say, for instance, the Finger Lakes, as you said earlier, you could potentially exploit very interesting sites at the moment just a bit too cold for vinifera. So that would be quite interesting. I'd um, love to see it. So um, somebody was mentioning we, China here and I actually worked in China in 2015 through 2017. And yeah, they're burying the vines completely, um, which is not necessary in the Eastern of North America just because we don't have the same level of dryness. So they're right on the edge of the Gobi Desert there. So they're, they're not just cold, but they're also dry. So it's a far more extreme 
like climate. And, and so if they don't completely bury the vines, they, the vines will freeze dry basically. And so like that kills the entire, not just the buds, but the entire vine. So they have to bury completely for that. Um, whereas we don't have that same level of extreme dryness, just the cold. So I just wanted to address that. So um, just, I'm aware that we're, our time is running a little short. I just wanted to have a quick rapid fire um, poll of the um, panelists on red vinifera varieties. Which ones are the best in, in, in New York State? Cabernet Franc. Cabernet Franc, right. That's a vote for Cabernet Franc. I still am holding out for Pinot Noir, um, but I think until everybody accepts like an 80 or $90 bottle of Pinot Noir from Finger Lakes, I don't think we're gonna really see a lot of movement that direction. I would agree with Pinot Noir as well. Um, it's just the, the amount of labor required to do it right in the field. It's, you know, that's why you see so much rosé and so much sparkling wine is it's a little easier to hide the, the mistakes in those wines when you're not fermenting on skins. Um, I, I do see some compelling Blaufrankish, but again, I see that as kind of a novelty after Cabernet Franc. So Cabernet, yeah. so Pinot Cabernet Franc are the two main ones, yeah? Yeah, Cabernet then, Franc right now is our best option. Like yeah. right now with where, the, what we've got able, what the stock we've got, the labor we've got, the, the winemaking we've got, the, the pricing that we, the market can bear, Cabernet Franc is our best option. But I, I'm, I'm still holding out hope that, that one day Pinot will, will be right up there. But like Nathan said, it's expensive to do it right. And so the bottle price has to be there. And so looking towards the future, guys, and rapid fire, do you see the varietal makeup of the Finger Lakes changing much in the next few years? I do not know. You know, it's funny because like when I started in the Finger Lakes in 03, um, you couldn't ripen Merlot, you couldn't ripen Sauvignon Blanc. You, you, Riesling was like the one thing you absolutely could ripen on a, on a standard basis. Malbec and Syrah were killed down to the ground every year. You know, and so those varieties now I see they're ripening much more consistently. So I think there's definitely been a climatic shift between 2003 when I was there and now. Um, so I don't think it's unreasonable to think that in the next 15 years, we will see things like Merlot uh, and Senator Long become bigger players in the market. Yeah, I don't see it shifting all that much, but I think... Um there will be more of a trend towards uh, hybrids and acceptance of them. And with that, you know, the, they're more sustainably farmed and people are going to learn how to make them better. So you'll see them, they, they won't ever steal the show. I mean, we know who the big winners are now, but you will see more general acceptance of them. Yeah, personally, my impression from visiting the region um, is that there's too many grapes at the moment being funneled into inexpensive sweet style wines mm -hmm. for the domestic tourism market. And now the region is looking to be more export focused. There's a, there's a, the low hanging fruit is taking some of those grapes that previously are making very low, low value, um, sort of like medium sweet or fully sweet um, wines that, that, you know, that are not basically internationally relevant and actually doing creative things with those those hybrid varieties and producing wines that are, are full of interest like this to show knack. I mean, this is this is totally relevant to export markets, I think, because it's interesting and it's not crazy expensive and it's got some personality from the region. So I think that that could be the low hanging fruit. That could be the, the easy win. And then the fine wine dimension as well, which is becoming very exciting. You know, that's that's also, you know, uh, really cool as well. So we're at, um, I think we're almost ready. Um, oh yes, it's exactly, exactly time. So I think what I'd like to do is I'd like to thank um, Ben, Nathan and Nova for their fantastic contributions. And it's just been a joy. Um, it's been a great joy tasting these wines, of course, but also talking with them and um, kind of taking this deep dive into the varieties of New York State. So thank you very much, everyone. Thank, Thank you. you. Pleasure Thank to be you. with you.
Thank you, Jamie. Thank you to our panelists. So a recording of today's webinar will be published to the New York Wine and Grape Foundation YouTube channel in the next couple of days. And all of you participants will receive an email with the link. And next month, uh, we will kick off the new year with the continuation of this series uh, with a special episode focused on vintage variation in New York State that will be conducted entirely in the French language with host Olivier Bourneuf, a wine critic at La Tulipe Rouge. The conversation will take place on Wednesday, January 13th. So thank you again, wishing you all a safe and enjoyable week.